So, from making the manufacturing the future of production. Uh, the topic is very close to what I do. Uh, I'm in the hacker or maker community since quite a while. And I was really wondering what is the whole thing about? Is it just a, you know, a trend, a buzzword? Or is there really a way that we can make this um, the future of production? So to talk about that, we have uh, four speakers that are all experts in their own fields. Uh, and their disciplines are, are a little bit uh, different, so that's why it's interesting to kind of see how can we uh, look at that topic uh, in, a, in a systemic way. So we have Nicolas Lassab, the founder of FabLab Artilect, Manuela Yamada from Brazil. Uh, are you a founder of Materia Brazil? Yes, you are. A partner. Antoine Boivin from uh, Valeo. And Hannah Stewart, a research fellow at Royal College of Arts. So I will give a, a moment for each of the speakers to introduce themselves, what's their work about, and what's the focus of what they're doing. And later, we'll go into some questions and really go deep into the topic. Thank you. So my, my name is Nicolas Lassab, I'm from Toulouse, and um, I created the first Fab Lab in, in France. And uh, we have uh, more than 1,000 members inside the Fab Lab. And the, the goal of the Fab Lab is to provide tools uh, to the printer, laser cutting, CNC machine, and people can came to can come to to make products and uh, prototype. And uh, we have also uh, uh, Artilec Lab. Um, Artilec Lab is is more for the professional. So the the open Fab Lab is uh, for uh, everyone. Company can it's possible for a company to come also to do prototyping. And it's, it's good to do, uh, if you want to challenge, for example, the community, uh, we have a different uh, section, architecture, biofab labs, and uh, uh, robotics, electronics. So you, it's possible for a company to challenge uh, our community. And after, if we want to accelerate the project, we have a professional part. OK, hi. Thank you for being here. I'm Manuela. I come from Brazil. And my company is called Materia Brasil. Basically, we are product designers. And we also run what is now the biggest open source material library. So we go after social and environmental responsible materials that are now available in Brazil. We select them. We analyze them through our own drivers. And we make all the information available for free on the internet through our platform. And we also give to the users the name of the manufacturers so they can contact them directly and we don't need to be the middleman. And uh, with that, what we really want is to empower people for them to take matters in their own hands and also to make knowledge available for everyone. And besides that, we run a consultancy company and also a product design company, which is the same. And uh, we work with manufacturing industry from big scale to small scale, depending on the project and the client. Bonjour à tous. Uh, my name is Antoine. Uh, uh, besides teaching, I've been working in uh, innovation in collaborating with SMEs, uh, startups, and big company. Right now, I work for uh, a tech company which is called Valeo, which is uh, in the automotive industry. And uh, we co-founded their uh, lab based and focused on user-centric uh, approach. Hello, I'm Hannah Stewart. I work at the Royal College of Art on a project about redistributing manufacture, particularly looking at the role of make spaces. And when we talk about make spaces, we're talking about fab labs, about hack spaces, and about open community factories. And we're very interested in their role, particularly in manufacturing and in mainstream production. And we have an awful lot of stories about the democratization of manufacturing, but what we're actually distributing at this point is access to tools, not access to the production systems. So our interest is in a very pragmatic inquiry to check what roles they're actually playing at this point and what roles they may play in the future. So as you see, we have a big industry played by Antoine. We have materials, we have a research into makerspaces, and someone who's going to talk about what is 
what does it mean to run a fab lab? My question um, comes very much from the work I do and from two tendencies that I see that kind of are being discussed in, in my opinion today, uh, two kind of parallel worlds. I find, you correct me if I'm wrong, we're going to discuss that, that in the world of industry, we talk about a lot uh, the industry 4.0, the machines that are going to talk to each other, the new production lines. And, um, well, I find the manufacturing, because that's manufacturing in my opinion, changed a little bit. What happened when we started using smartphones and all the smart devices is that we kind of want more and faster and we kind of crave products that really correspond our needs. So we're the consumers, we, we somehow have the superpower of dictating the markets. So I think the industry has a big challenge of redesigning their uh, production lines and uh, coming closer to the user. And at the same time, we see what I call it a grassroots movement that kind of grew up from you know, hackers turning fab labs, maker spaces, uh, people starting to collaborate on the net, you know, web engineering, uh, in an open source way to bring to the market a new sort of um, products that are designed by the users and often fabricated um, next to uh, the person that's going to use or buy the product. Uh, people are now able to, I know, see and seek at their own homes. So those are two uh, topics that really have a potential to, you know, work together and to build um, an infrastructure for the future of production. And uh, the first question that I have and the first topic that I would like to discuss is, is, you know, maker, because we talk about, you know, the big maker movement, uh, we all are supposed to be makers, we go to maker fairs and we go to fab labs, is making and manufacturing the same thing? And I will just start maybe by Hannah. Um, short answer, no. <laughs> Absolutely not. Thank you. Um, and the motivations behind making and the motivations of batch production and the motivations of large-scale manufacture are completely different motivations, completely different set of conditions. And in many ways, the challenge is in creating this kind of participatory manufacturing ecosystem is in understanding that and in understanding how different they are and also where they can complement each other. And coming up with protocols where you can have makers within a space able to access um, plans that can be interoperable with large-scale production as well. So, um, for me, the question is, um, um, with, a, with a Fab Lab, it's possible to do prototyping. And the, the question is, uh, uh, what is the next step for the Fab Lab? And uh, uh, the goal maybe could be to do production. So for sure, when, when we have industry, it's possible to do a million and million of objects. But this, uh, this object could be for the, could be for the most of the people. But if you're looking for something very specific, you. Uh, most of the time, you will, you will don't find the adapted project you want or, or the product you, you really want. So now with a Fab Lab, it's possible to, uh, to go and produce something. So you produce for yourself. And the, the next step, this is the question, is the next step, is it possible from a, uh, from a Fab Lab to start to do production? And uh, actually, it's very difficult inside the Fab Lab to do it. But uh, I think we, we, uh, we will start to have more and more a uh, good machine to do uh, to do production. Uh, uh, there is a lot of 3D printer. For now, they are very slow, but they start to uh, to uh, to be more accurate and uh, and faster. So, I think we will start to to see some machine uh, available. So you say that to making and and manufacturing is not the same thing. You say that production starts to be possible in the in the in a fab lab. But I would like to like, have a, a question, like in an industry, you know, there is a massive difference between what's happening today in an industry, in mass production, and what's happening in a, in a fab lab or in a makerspace. Like, what is, like, sh give us a picture of, of what's manufacturing for Valeo. First of all is uh, money and timing. You're saying that in a few minutes you can print uh, a piece or whatever feature, and in the big industry, 
for example, in automotive, it's from three to five years from, co from uh, ideation to, uh, to manufacturing line. So timing is not good. But there are links regarding to this because the, let's say that regarding what you were saying about the needs of consumers and citizens to have more and more quicker and to be adapted and to fit in their life, of course, this is influencing the big industries. And the big industries, from a hardware point of view, cannot uh, compress time. And at the same time, uh, uh, let's say techno te technological rep uh, disrupt is big, it's few year cycles. But software and use habits disrupt is few months, few weeks. So there is a gap that can be filled in that, in that way. Manuela, have you been working with a big industry? Uh, yes, we've worked with big industries and we've worked with uh, small projects. And uh, it's completely different timing, it's completely different uh, frame. And even big industries, I can tell you that, that we worked for an aircraft company and uh, because they wanted us to develop new materials for them to use and to select new, materi uh, new materials that were available in the market. And uh, they, they face a problem, which is something that I think many people face when they go to fab labs or maker spaces. That is, as there are these special aircraft, they don't produce uh, enough aircraft to be able to go knock on the door of the supplier of the material and say, hey, can you please give this to me? So this is something that, that th where are the boundaries between industry and small productions, which can be linked to maker spaces and fab labs. So in the end, what they needed to do was they need to partner with uh, Peugeot, the automotive industry, to be able to have the material they needed because they needed a big industry to order that material so they could like scooch in a little bit and order with them. And, um, and yeah, I, I don't know, this is my completely personal opinion, but the Fab Lab and the Maker Spaces, they are enabling a lot of innovation because the timing is much faster, as you said, than the industry. But at the same time, when it comes the moment to, okay, implement this to the market, and this I can say because I've seen a lot of cool projects that we incubated inside our own company, they don't have the, the market timing to be able to fill the gap. I think, Nicola, you guys were working with uh, Festo, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. and also with Airbus. Yeah, I, I was working uh, for Festo uh, before the Fab Lab. I mean, um, I was working at Cornell. It was a lab, uh, and uh, in s inside this lab, uh, I was doing uh, uh, modular robotics, these kind of things. And the goal was to do innovation. I mean, it's, it's, um, and it's true, inside uh, the Fab Lab, you can go fast and quickly. And this is a goal to, uh, uh, when you have an idea, the goal is to, uh, to, uh, to get quickly the, the result, to know if this idea is good or not. And uh, we work this way with, with Festo. And the, the goal was, was to provide uh, modular robots and uh, we print them and uh, these kind of things. And uh, so the Fab Lab is good for, uh, you, you're true, to, uh, to go very fast and challenge people and have a lot of idea. And, uh, and this is very difficult to do inside the industry because you have a lot of process. And uh, sometimes you can do research. But for example, we have 1,000 members. So it's, it's very easy for us to have a lot of idea because we, uh, we, will a we ask uh, our community and all the community will respond, ah, yes, I saw this and uh, people do this and uh, there is this small thing over there and uh, you can have uh, this material and, uh, and in, uh, in, uh, in other fab lab or wherever and, uh, and uh, this is go fast and, uh, and after. So we work with company to, uh, uh, to provide idea and to, to do the, the first prototype. And after, when you, we need to, uh, to industrialize, uh, uh, we have some partner to, to, to do that. Yeah. So I feel like there is a sort of a romance going on between like, the two worlds. But like, in, in, in my point of view, and I love the you know, Fabla community and makers community, but I somehow feel that we talk a lot and we kind of dream about the distributed manufacturing, production back in the cities, uh, you know, user, producer, uh, and all those things, which I find would be like amazing, because that would, you know, bring, kind of develop a different sort of economy, you know, give employment to people, 
and so on. But I somehow feel like us coming from the, the bottom up, um, we dream about the factory of, of Fab Lab or Makerspace being the factory of the future. I see those slides all the time. There is a CNC machine and there is a big text that says the factory of the future. Uh, Hannah, what is, what is the, the place of a makerspace, maybe we're going to go further, and, and a fab lab, uh, and the distributed manufacturing? I think there's, there's two things. With the two different types of myths that you're kind of saying about the kind of industry 4.0 and the kind of makerspace as the factory of the future, neither one of those has space for local manufacturers, and that's a really big gap because big industry has an ecosystem of small-scale manufacturers built around it. Makerspaces need to be integrated within their local produ production communities as well. So I kind of feel like the role of makerspaces in distributed manufacturing should be as a node within a kind of mesh network of manufacturing, a kind of full biodiverse ecosystem of different scale scales of production. We shouldn't be trying to kind of scale up and out a naive vision that 3D printers are manufacturing. They're, they're one tool within a set of production tools. We should instead be kind of scaling up and out the cultures that we're making within these spaces and the kind of the behaviors and the awareness of materials, material consequence and human consequence of production. Because there's no point in us localizing production if what we're localizing is toxic consequences of production. Yes, I think there's something interesting in what, in what Anna said. It's the, the question about scale up is a, is a great question. In fact, even the, the maker communities, even the Fab Labs, is going from a, a guy doing stuff in his garage and trying to organize. And then there even, even has to be a scale in a, a networking. Because, for example, I, I don't know how, much, how many uh, Fab Labs are in Paris right now. And are they all connected? Or is it like in, uh, in uh, cities where everyone, every city wants to have his swimming pool, his library, and they don't share books? You know, so first of all, there is uh, a scale up in, in terms of networking from the making, uh, making environments. Then from the uh, industry level, of course, uh, this, this, this scaling part is, is, is at the same time quite uh, inspiring, but at the same time it's quite a nightmare, you know, always scaling up. And for example, uh, for hardware, it's difficult to bring back hardware uh, fa uh, uh, fabrics or factories in the cities. But you, you already have some software factories in the cities. But there is always the other part from big industries and libera liberalism. You have factories of software, software engineers in Egypt, in Asia, working for uh, Western companies. So you have also this, and you could find also. I, I, I usually, we usually work. Uh, with trying to make dissociation and trying to see what could be the worst to imagine the, the best. And for now, in big um, in big industries, you have uh, in kind of third world countries or low salary countries, you got guys who are manufacturing hardware. But now a doctor can practice surgery from miles and kilometers away. Okay, so it could be a nightmare if these guys from Asia, Egypt, or whatever, they put their glove in some virtual reality and they build and manufacture stuff that, is, uh, that are actually produced in Western countries. So now you have, you, 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 we have to think in both ways what could be worse, what could be good, in, in order to find ourselves what really we want to do, no? Yeah, this is a very interesting thing. It's the futuristic vision because we see ourselves like saving the world and, you know, doing irresponsible products and fab labs and integrating community and doing all that thing. And at the same time, we have this huge, uh, we still have technology advancing. It's not only 3D printers becoming more efficient, but it's also, you know, what you're saying, virtual reality, you know, using the tele teletravail, using the work through the internet. The internet is not only bringing the good stuff, it can also you know, bring people here producing in China. But I also find that there is one thing that's interesting, us you know, hoping to uh, you know, save the world. That's what you told me before. Yeah, yeah I mean, we are believers, so we got to keep believing because <laughs> if we have no hope, where do we go? But in the same time, this is one thing because I work in sustainability consultancy. So, 
for that, I'm a believer. But then we see all this decentralized uh, production means, but where does your 3D printer actually comes from? Where does your filament comes from? Where does your CNC router comes from? I mean, how actually decentralized are our decentralized manufacturing processes? And, um, and we can see this happening. I mean, I, I come from the south part of the world, and therefore, if I need a 3D printer, there was one company that used to manufacture it in Brazil, but yeah, it was kind of too hard. <laughs> so they stopped it, and now I just bought one that came from Hong Kong. So, and, and this comes from me, you know, supposedly a person that understands a lot, but still, you, you kind of don't, don't have a scape to go. And another point that I think is to whom this, the industry is serving. So, the consi ha there is one question that I think we need to also put in the table that is, how do we want to consume? Because if we want to consume H&M style, we will still need China. But if we want to consume in a different way, maybe we can have Fab Labs. So there is a lot of balance to be established yet. And a lot of contradictories because these South countries are the ones who want to consume like we do. And, and in the Western side, we want to consume, you know? And there is a lot of contact contradictories that have to be taken into account. For example, when you say we want to bring the manufacturing inside of cities or in suburban, when manufacturers growth in 18th centuries, they were like the church. They built workers around. It was center of life. Now manufacturers, if you make them bam, they are nowhere places, you know? And, and in the same time, for makers to grow from making to organizing themselves, if you take Marx's uh, definition of, of, of bourgeoisie, it's owning a, a producing tool. So everybody can use his producing tool. So it's, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, notions that are going in contradiction and changing uh, in a way. So we have to tack tackle them to try to understand what we want to do really and who, from who we are, you are working for. Hannah, Nicola. And um, for, for the Fab Lab, so it's true, uh, most of the machine from the uh, industry and uh, uh, so um, uh, Neil, who, who is the founder of the, of the Fab Lab network, said uh, actually we, are, um, uh, we have a Fab Lab 1.0. So there are all the machines from the industry. And uh, we will start to have Fab Lab 2.0. And the goal is to, from a Fab Lab, to make another Fab Lab. So uh, the, the goal is to, pr to create machine, open source machine. And from this machine, you create new machine. And um, actually, we are working on uh, one project in Toulouse. The name is Orcas. And the goal is to, uh, to have uh, open source uh, modules to create machine, robots, and uh, IoT device, and the goal is to provide this to people to create uh, new robot, new machine, and uh, and for uh, for company maybe create small uh, supply chain. Because um, um, when you um, when you want to produce something, even for the uh, for the big company, when the, uh, when the one of the challenges is uh, uh, for supply chain, most of the time the cost is uh, four millions. And if you want a new product, sometimes you, you need to change all your supply chain. And, uh, and one of the goal is to try to have, uh, uh, um, uh, to have m more modules to adapt your supply chain. And like this, you can uh, quickly change your products. And, uh, and uh, I think it's possible to, to start to provide new tools, open source, to, to do this. And uh, this is a good question for startup. We, we know a lot of startups in Toulouse. Well, what they need, they need to, to produce something. And uh, there is a question. Uh, uh, the question is, uh, you produce yourself your, what you need, or you send it in uh, something, in your, you send your data and a file to, uh, uh, to produce in China. And uh, some of the startups start to produce their own tools to start to produce it directly. And, uh, and I think we will, because it's necessary when you, are, you don't have any money and, uh, and there is a cost to go to China and, uh, and you need to be sure to, to find a good uh, factory to produce your things. And uh, so some people start, uh, uh, there is a, a company, Emotion Tech, and they produce 3D printer and they use their own 3D printer to produce uh, uh, the part of the 3D printer and uh, as they work like this. So some part from China, but uh, uh, some of the parts they, they produce uh, directly. But there's another link that I see which you've mentioned, which was about changing the way we consume. 
And like, I, th I know Fab Labs are more, forgive me, tech oriented. I also say sometimes, you know, uh, sort of price, you know, technology is the answer, what was the question? And then I think if you take like maker spaces, there's, it's a different environment also. You know, it, I, I feel like it's less tech oriented. It's more about, you know, the doing it with your hands. And, you know, it's a different consumer and it's, it's a different producer, it's a different consumer. And that also brings us back to, you know, the, 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 the traditional, more traditional uh, production. And I think, like, maybe I'd like to ask you, the maker spaces, what, what, what is, you know, the role of, of maker space in all that? I think to answer that, you kind of look at what's being produced within maker spaces. And when we, um, and I don't think it's just about kind of what material goods and services are being made. I think it's also kind of what types of people are being made within those spaces and what kinds of new processes and new ways of working are coming out of them. And we'd see Fab Labs as one type of maker space. And I don't think, despite the kind of aspiring unity of the global Fab Lab network, I don't, I think there are distinct types of Fab Labs. And like the ones that are within industry are very different in flavor to the ones that are within education, to the ones that are standalone within communities or social enterprises. Um, and each of them produces different things. Um, but one of the things that they seem to all produce is a new type of subjectivity. So a new way of seeing themselves in the world as consumers and as makers and as kind of the prosumers, where you've got the crossover of the two. And in a way, what's very interesting about that is not just how it changes where and how we make things, but also where the risk and reward is in making things. And where the, yeah, where the kind of, who the risk is on. So at the moment, the risk and the liability for the environmental consequence of goods and things is very much on the consumer, because they're the kind of end user who's then the custodian. Whereas now, if you've got a slightly different relationship to material through making, through being within the make space, through this kind of new way of thinking, um, you've got a different relationship as a custodian of material. And, and we're starting to see some product designers making more kind of intelligent decisions about circular economy decisions. And then we're also seeing industry as well, kind of taking responsibility and turning towards a service model where you give back the material and it's kind of put back in to the production process. I think this is something that you work on yeah, in Va at Valeo. To follow the, your last uh, sentence, the matter of responsibility, I think it's, it's everyone's. Because if you regard any organization, which is a, can be a non-governmental one or a big industry, they will all tell you that they are responsible and blah, 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 you know. So maybe that's not the responsibility, is, is what, how, with small steps, you can try to, to disrupt and shortcut uh, a, a process that looks obviously working and why w questioning it. Uh, in the automotive uh, industry, in France, for example, the average uh, age of buying a, a new car is 55 years old. And guys change their, change their car every 10 to 15 years. So obviously it's not a, a rapid and dynamic market. But within this time, you, you, you use your a car, you use a car in a, a mobility uh, system and you have your own habits and you do what you do the way you want to do. So there is this contradiction between the everyday use and this big box with made with metal, who could be th th thought in another way. Let's take the example of this Chinese Italian from the oh, oh, open source vehicle. And there is something interesting is that in big companies there is a still a big work division, you know, electronician, yeah. you know. But sometimes in the maker environment you can find the same. Why in this open source vehicle, they don't add uh, software guys and try to, to tackle the, the, the autonomous uh, car projects, no? We will ask them later, Simon. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's, you know, there's, it's like, um, um, we, for example, we think that in a way to disrupt and to shortcut the normal process is going from, uh, supplier to a provider. 
In fact, I work in a B2B industry. So normally it's business to business, no end user. But in fact, some B2C, they have n absolutely no contact with end users. Insurance company, they have brokers. Car manufacturers, Renault, you were saying, they have brokers who sell cars. They don't sell directly. So in fact, they have a lot of quantitative data, but not qualitative data. So what we try to do is to, inside a B2B company, work on end users, with end users, to try to identify how they, how they live, how they behave, and try to adapt it to pro propose functions and new opportunities. Yeah, but yeah, I have this like a uh, worst case scenario in my head because I find like again I find that manufacturing and I think it's not only me plays a, a fundamental like it used to play a fundamental ro role in, in in our economic systems. So we can talk a lot about you know software. We can talk a lot about service, but like look look around us. This is all physical. You know everything like most of the things we kind of spend money on is like physical products. So, you know, we can't talk about um, the new economy without rethinking production because, you know, we're still going to be surrounded by physical objects. Maybe we're going to all go to sleep and put our v virtual reality helmets and then it's all going to be service and, 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 and software. But I believe that in the community of makers and, and, and hackers, there is this huge innovation, there is this transdisciplinarity, there is, you know, risk taking, you know, going further and, and producing new solutions, working in open source, doing open innovation, doing all those amazing things. And I, I somehow start to worry that, and I have nothing against big industries because, I mean, we have to work together and I think... Neither against me. Yeah, so I'm just wondering if it's going to turn into, you know, big industries learning from fab labs and learning from makerspaces and adapting all those things inside of the companies or is, you know, it's going to kind of change and maybe the big industry is going to shrink uh, and, you know, the fab labs and makerspaces will play an integrated role in the supply and manufacturing chain. And is there a way to kind of make things work together so that it stays, you know, focused on the end consumer, on us, and it just doesn't make more money for, like, existing, you know, established um, companies. Do you, do, do you think it's possible to then build this collaboration between two, you know, ecosystems and go into, which is obvious, um, this more agile, more responsive, uh, ways of production, I would call it the citizen production, or are we doomed uh, and it's just all gonna, you know, stay as it is, it's just gonna find new ways of, um, you know, taking things from the community. I will, sorry for, you know, drawing this black scenario, but I think we should ask ourselves this question. Okay, I, I think I can jump in here, because what, when you say manufacturing plays, or it used to play a major role in our economic system, then we can look at it and say, okay, so you were the ones who, with pardon of the word, kind of screwed everything up. And uh, yes, actually, it was. And in my profession as well as a product designer and me myself as a consumer. But at the same time, if we had the ability to cause all of this damage, we need to look at the system to m and use it to kind of reverse what we did. So when y and then when you say, oh, we are all responsible, yes, we are all responsible. So this is why I myself don't think we should like, throw stones into big industries, but uh, try to make a new approach into it. And yes, maybe shrink it a little bit. Uh, our company, we are registered as a small industry, actually, and we have a license to manufacture, and we do manufacture uh, all of our materials because we have four materials that we developed ourselves. But, uh, and then the first question everyone does, oh, do you have a patent on your materials? No, they're open source. If you want to do it, just call us and we'll teach you how to do it. But you still will need to buy machinery uh, to be able, but it's a small scale. So h how all of this stuff can relate? Because then we had the, an aircraft company, which is in Braer, which is kind of the same as uh, Bombardier, 
for those of you who are French, and, uh, and we can supply them. So then you can implement a small change into a huge industry. And if, we and if you start bringing like, this transformation, the same impact they had for one side, they will have to the other. So I think it's mandatory that these two sides start to integrate into fab labs, maker spaces, small industries that can uh, be suppliers for one side of the, of the, the world, and big industries who can absolutely learn and innovate from maker spaces because they are so much more agile. I, I think the thing can go very fast. And uh, well, for example, there is um, the network 3D hub. Is a, so uh, many people uh, uh, is a kind of is a network, and uh, each people has a 3D printer. And uh, if you want to print something, you can go on on this website and ask someone, uh, for example, in Paris, to print something, and uh, and the people with people can print and do their own factory and print for anybody. So it's like a distributed factory. And uh, I think the community, there is more than 10,000 printers in, in the world. And he, he, the, this network grows very fast. And, um, and there is a lot of projects like this. And uh, I think uh, there is Planet Lab. Planet Lab, they do uh, satellite. Uh, very small satellite, and uh, when you think a satellite is very expensive, it's like 200 million to send uh, something and to produce. And, uh, and a small company, three guys in the garage said, we want to know on the planet uh, what is the data of the country. Uh, we want to know if there is some uh, uh, shape, and uh, we want to know data from uh, China, how, they pr how many uh, bots uh, go to from China to Europe, these kind of things. And they said, we will produce an on satellite, satellite very cheap, and they did it. They did, and uh, so now the, the big company, I mean, like Thales, start to think to, to, uh, to create very small satellites. So from, sm I mean, from, from a small project, you can have a very big impact and, uh, in different fields. And so I, I think this is a period of transition. And it, it will be this. I mean, all the big companies need to think what is what what will be the next model, and uh, the model will change. And uh, uh, is it necessary to change now or not? And, and there uh, is one thing we're slowly closing. There is one thing that you've said that made me think, which is the community, because I mean the the, the major difference between the traditional industry and you know the other is that the whole thing comes with community. And it kind of closes the loop of the discussion and what you've said. It is still, you know, bringing s value to society, uh, the transfer of knowledge, um, you know, the transfer of, uh, you know, the learning of new skills, opening the box, fixing, uh, you know, the whole thing that we, we're going to find in those things that you can't, you know, find in, you know, tra tra traditional industry. And uh, how do you think we should like close it with this maybe rather positive note of how do we you know build this social more infrastructure to you know bring more reflection to you know the minds of all the consumers about how the choices you know we make influence you know the whole ecosystem, and I will leave it on you, Hannah. Oh my. <laughs> That's very kind of you. <laughs> I think it's very much about transparency, about recognizing and knowing what the consequence of materials is. And I think some of that is materials literacy, and some of that goes back to education, it goes back to schools, and it goes back to kind of understanding how and where things are made. But I kind of think the thing that will make this a scalable solution that can kind of integrate across the uh, big industry and the make spaces and the fab labs and the individual producers is the interoperability. So it's having protocols and ways of working together so that we can do a form of packet routing, essentially reroute how we produce things so that they're kind of the least possible bad solution, the least possible consequences. Like if we could just aim for less planetary death, I think that would be a positive way forward. And I think the kind of some of that is about data sharing and distributing data, not materials. 
but some of that's also about recognizing that we're inventing social protocols too. We're inventing the protocols of how consumers relate to products and the protocols of how big industry relates to workers, to workers' rights and to consequences of production. So, so there is no future of robots in the factories and <laughs> people, you know, having a basic income at home, writing poetry. It's, it, and, and it's not, at the same time, you know, the, the fab labs and maker spacing becoming the new factories. It's a, it's a and I'm going to use the word, an ecosystem of all those actors, you know, trying to work together to bring, you know, innovation to the industry, uh, to maybe bring the industry down to, to the consumers and try to develop a networks, an infrastructure of a citizen production. Yeah, I think so. I, yeah, it's not only in terms of growth. Mm. It's, it's not a vertical. Uh, of course, makers influence big companies. Yeah. They look from a very <laughs> strange eyes, but it has to be. It, it has to be that way. That's why, for example, now I made. Uh, I, I work. I, I we hired guys from video game, from ethno ethnographic background. So designers, whatever. The aim, of course, is to try to influence from the inside, right? Mm -hmm. But also, there's something interesting, <laughs> is that you can still be a big company yeah. and produce less yeah. and sell the same. Order. For example, Michelin is manufacturing tires, and they launched the Michelin service where they rent tires to truck company. Mm -hmm. You have in Barcelona also this... Uh, um, this uh, in fact, uh, this university who is trying to do this uh, rapid prototyping at the architectural Yuck. level, which is try, try quite interesting. So I think also from the maker's point of view, they need to also be kind of in, in the mindset of big companies and trying to advise them and consult them and try to get into them and not seeing them, ah, oh, they're dirty, they're big, they're, they're, they're mad. Yeah. So I think that the topic is really interesting. I think we can go on and, and on and on because I don't think much is being discussed. So what I suggest is we're going to stop here. Uh, we're going to invite people that are interested to join our conversation to the Maif Terrace. And we're going to run a short Q&A session with all the speakers. And so that I promote similar events to POC21, I would invite one person on stage. Thank you, guys. Uh,